Well, welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you're here, whether you, uh, you brave the crazy rain that we've had for like the last, feels like, year. Uh, uh, I think all of us need to be scuba certified to be able to live here at this point. Um, or maybe you're watching at home. Maybe you're like, man, I'm not getting out in that. Uh, we're, we're grateful that you're here. And our hope and prayer is that this will become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. And happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the room. Man, I'm so excited for you and thankful for you. Yeah. And then here at Front Range, we, we like to add a little bit more, and we say it's Ladies' Day as well. So whether you're a mom or, or, or a lady in any stage, we want to let you know that we have all kinds of things going on to try to get you connected. Uh, we have outdoor activities and women's hikes uh, that go on. We have uh, uh, mops, which is mothers of preschoolers, and ladies' nights, and just all kinds of stuff. And if you want any information about any of that, there's uh, a table uh, and some, some, uh, some people that will be out there after service to my left, your right, right behind you, so it's under the covering in case it's raining. Um, and then another part of that is make sure you stop by there because, ladies, we have a gift for uh, each one of you, and we just want to celebrate you. And our hope and prayer is that you uh, not only feel celebrated by the people in your life, you feel celebrated by our church, uh, and that more importantly, you, see, you feel seen by God and that you know that you are loved. Um, one of the reasons that we, uh, we call it Ladies' Day is because, not, not to try to diminish Mother's Day by any means, but we know that Mother's Day is one of the most polarizing days of the year. For some of us, it's an exciting time. It's celebratory. We're so grateful for the blessings that we have in our life. And for others of us, uh, maybe it's a remembrance of pain. Uh, maybe it's a, a remembrance of, of something that we don't have or we're not able to have or something like that. We know it's very polarizing. And so we want every woman in here and every woman watching online uh, to know how much we love you and how much we appreciate you. To those who uh, have experienced new life or are expecting new life or maybe you have close relationships with your kids, we celebrate you today. For those who have lost a child or a mother this year, or maybe you have a broken relationship with a child, we, we mourn with you. And we want you to know we walk with you in any way that we can in this, this season of life. To those who are in the trenches of parenting, step-parenting, foster parenting, spiritual parenting, we're better because of you and because of your sacrifice and we thank you for that sacrifice. And for those of you who are going to have emptier nests in the coming year, uh, we celebrate with you and we're a little jealous of you at the same time. Uh, to, no matter what season of life you're in, ladies, we love you. So men, do me a huge favor. Like the Broncos just won something, maybe two games, uh, or the Nuggets win a championship. Let's give it up for the ladies in our lives. Come on. Yeah. Hey, last service, the men stood up. Some of the guys stood up. I'm just saying, come on, man, let's give it up for them. I was so grateful, so grateful for you. And uh, let's, let's, let's just admit this, though. No, no matter if you're a, a father or a mother, how many of you can admit, by show of hands, how many of you would say, parenting is hard? Anybody, anybody wants to? Yeah, thank you. If you're not raising your hand, you forgot. Somehow you forgot. Uh, or you're not a, a parent yet. Parenting is hard. It's one of the most challenging things you can do. And I remember before I was a parent, I was really critical of parents, right? Like I knew that I would be a better parent than any of the ones that I saw. Uh, there were parents that would discipline their kids for things that they probably shouldn't discipline their kids for. And there were parents that didn't discipline their kids when they probably should have disciplined their kids. And then probably the, the greatest offender of a parent was the one that would let their kid have technology at the table. Right? Like, I would never, I could, I could, like, when I saw that, I'm like, where's our society going? Like, I'll never allow my kids to have technology at the table. I'll never be like those parents at all. <laughs> hey, get that picture down. That's not supposed to be up there. I remember always just thinking, man, I'll, I'll be better. And then I became a parent. I'm like, wow, this is really, really tough. You know, it's one of the few things that you can do, and you can do everything right. Not that any of us do, but you can do everything right, and it still may not turn out the way that you want. Right? Like I've seen the absolute best parents and their kids have fallen away from the Lord and, and gone way away from the family and all of that. And I've seen the absolute worst parents and their kids turn out un, like unbelievable. Like what if somebody would have come up to you and say, I have a proposal for you. Uh, for the next at least 18 years, somebody after last service said 26, at least, at least, at least 18 years you're going to spend a fortune. Uh, and, and there's going to be sleepless nights 
and there's probably going to be a lot of tears. And, and, and by the way, it may not turn out the way that you want. Would you take that proposal? Right? That's what parenting is. And those of us who are parents, we'd say yes all day. Why? Because of the, the joy, the love, the possibility, the opportunity to be able to impact the life of somebody else and the possibility of them becoming a, 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 a citizen that is actually contributing to society and doing something good. Like most of us would say, yes, I would take that every day. But parenting is hard. And today we're going to look at a parable that uh, Jesus speaks that's not just about parenting, that's about relationships, and it's about the reality of life. Uh, we've been in a series right now called Stories of a Kingdom where we're looking at parables of Jesus. These are, these are short stories that Jesus tells that speak truth to us. If you've missed any of them, you can go to our message series hub on our website. You just scan the QR code on your worship guide or go to our website uh, and you can find it there. But our, on our message series hub, there's all kinds of resources. If you want to dive deeper into parables, into what we're teaching on, if you want to watch any past messages, anything like that, just go there and you can get all the resources there. We're going to dive straight in. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you don't, no worries. It's going to be up on the screen. Hey, if you need a Bible, as you're heading to the car, if you need to step out of the rain, just go underneath that blue tent, we'll get you a Bible. We don't need name, your money. We don't need any of that stuff. We just want to resource people. Or you can download the Bible app. So Luke 15, starting with verse 1 and 2, here's what it says. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now it's important to understand who's listening to the story. At the very beginning it says that there's tax collectors and sinners. These were like the worst of the worst. Right? This would be like, like Jesus allowing Democrats around him or allowing Republicans around him or allowing chief spans around him, like the worst humans that you could possibly think of. This is who's surrounding Jesus. And then you have the religious leaders and the religious teachers. Now, instead of them being happy that these terrible humans were sitting around Jesus learning from him, they're, he's judging, they're judging these guys. They're judging Jesus. They're judging the, the sinners. And they're like, they're looking down on them. They're talking negatively about them. This is the audience. It's really important to understand this. This is the audience that Jesus speaks this parable to. Let's continue. Verse 11. Jesus continues. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. Other translations, or later we'll find out, that wild living meant prostitution, drugs, that type of thing. A lot of partying going on. Verse 14, after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, which was a Gentile. Again, another awful human. He's hiring himself out to this person who went who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So there's a younger son in this story, and this younger son says, hey, I want my inheritance. Give it to me. And so he got his inheritance, and then he went out and he squandered it on prostitutes and on drugs and alcohol and partying and, and all of that. And now he's in a situation where he's basically living with pigs that he's taking care of, wanting their food. He's in a bad place. You ever been in a bad place before? You ever been in a place where you're like, man, how, how did I even get here? How do I get out of here? Maybe it was just one day or maybe for some of us it was a season. I've been in a, a bad place a few times in my life. One of those times was before I met Christ, I had an issue with alcohol. And I knew I needed to stop, but I just, I just didn't feel like I could. I remember my last time drinking, I had 25 shots of liquor in 15 minutes, and I should have died. But instead of dying, I blacked out, and the next morning I got a report of what happened, and it wasn't good. I was lying in a, in a tub in my own puke in a house that I didn't know anybody. I didn't know even the owner. I thought, how did I get here? And where do I go? It was at the bottom of the bottom. Where do I go from here? It's kind of where this this son is, and let's take a look at what he did when he hit rock bottom. Look at verse 17. He says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. 
I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. The Bible says he came to his senses. He thought, man, something has to change. So I'm just going to go back. And, and, and I'm going to admit to my dad that I've sinned against him. I've sinned against uh, 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 heaven and God. And I've sinned against everything. And, and yet here I am. Can you just make me like one of your hired servants? Just make me like one of them so at least I can eat food for that day. Now, how is this father going to respond? Like, how would you respond in that moment? Your son came to you or somebody came to you, took what they thought was, was owed, but something that was really yours. You gave it to them. They went out. They blew it all. And now here they come back. I think my first response would be, this is the bed you made. Like, these were your actions. Now you're going to have consequences. You're, just, you're suffering the consequences of your own actions. If I was a father, that's probably how I would respond. Well, let's see how... The dad responds, look at verse 20, he says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The father does something that's not expected. It says while he was a long ways off, the father sees him, and he runs after him. And what does he do when he gets there? Does he lecture him? No. Does he say, hey, you can go get a job with my higher servants. That's, that's all I've got for you. No. Does he say, hey, I wish you were more like your older brother. If you'd just be more like him, you wouldn't be in this situation. No. He hugs him. He kisses him. And then the narrative continues. It says that the son says, hey, dad, I'm sorry. I've, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. Will you just allow me to be one of your hired servants? I just, I just need food in my belly. And dad says, no way. You're not going to be like one of my hired servants. You're my son. Welcome home. In fact, he looks at one of his, his servants and he says, hey, go kill the fattened calf. Go, we're going to have a party. Go get my robe. Go get my, 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 the ring. Go get the sandals. Go get everything and put it on my son because we're going to have a party because my son is home. I love what it says here in verse 24. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. And what a celebration. Imagine. Imagine being the son. You're just coming home going, if I can just get some food. And your dad goes, no, you're not just going to get food. You're my son. Welcome home. Like, I, I understand what you've done, but welcome home. Imagine being the dad. Imagine not worrying about where your son is anymore, not knowing if he's still alive, not knowing what, what he's doing or what he's participating in or what's going on in his life. He's home. Imagine the celebration. Everyone is happy. Everyone is excited. Well, not everyone. Let's take a look at verse 25. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what was going on? Hey, your brother's come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. The older brother was angry. Everybody else was excited, but not the older brother. In fact, he goes to his dad. And he says, Dad, why, why, why are you doing this? Why are you throwing a party for him? He says, why are you throwing a party for your son? He can't even say his name. He can't even say my brother. He said, why are you throwing a party for your son? He wasted all of his, his inheritance on prostitutes and drugs and, and all of that. And I've worked for you. I've done everything right, and you've never thrown me a party. There's like this bitterness there. And I think when you look at this parable, there's, there's so much we could dive into. But what I want to do is I want to address three perspectives that, that I think will teach us some truths about our own lives. I, here's my opinion. My opinion is that every one of us in here is going to fall into one of these three perspectives. And so whatever perspective it is, as you identify with that one, then identify with the truth that God's trying to speak to you today. The first perspective is, is of that of the, the young son, the prodigal. And the truth there is that you are never too far gone. You are never too far gone. The emphasis Jesus is putting on this part of the story is that you can come home and you should come home. It says that when this younger son got to the end of his rope, when, it, when he came to his senses, when he's like, man, what am I doing? 
Like I've been trying to do this on my own. It's just not working out. I need to go home. There's some of us today that we've just been trying to do it on our own. And it's not working out. And maybe you feel like the younger son where you're at the bottom of the bottom, or maybe you haven't hit there yet. My encouragement, don't get there. But if you realize that, man, my life isn't going in the direction that I want, and I, my, doing it on my own just isn't paying off the way that the world promises that it will pay off, come home. Not only can you come home, but you should come home. Now, this is the story of the gospel. I mean, this is, this is why Jesus died on the cross for you and I. The story of the gospel is that God loved you so much. He loved me so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross for our sins. Why? Because our sins deserved a payment of death. We deserve to pay that, but God loved you and I so much, he's like, I'm going to pay it. And so Jesus died on the cross for us so that we can come home. So that no matter how far gone you may feel, no matter how deep in sin you may be right now, no matter how far away from home you are sensing, no matter if you haven't felt God's presence in a long time, maybe you're just here because your mom asked you to come or because your wife asked you to come. God sees you and you're never too far gone. He's inviting you home today. No matter what your past, no matter what sin you're currently in, no matter how far you feel from God in this moment, God's saying, come home. Come home. So to the prodigal, to the one who's far off, you're never too far gone. From the older brother, brother's perspective, we learn that no one is undeserving or unworthy of God's grace. No one is undeserving or unworthy of God's grace. We love the first point, right, that no one is too far gone, but how quickly it changes when that no one becomes someone that we don't, becomes someone that we don't like. And we're like, wait a second, God, you, you can't let them turn their life around. I mean, like, think about the, the, the audience that Jesus is talking to here. There, there are these religious leaders that are looking down on the sinners and the tax collectors. And Jesus is saying, don't be like them. I read this story, and I'm like, I can't believe these guys. Like, they should be ashamed of themselves for judging and condemning like that. And how quickly I become the older brother. How quickly I become the guy that's sitting outside the party with my hands crossed. Well, and that person doesn't deserve it. I mean, if they just would have listened in the first place, they wouldn't be in the pain that they're in. Or if they just would truly follow God, then they wouldn't be going through some of the things that they're going through right now. How quickly I become the older brother going, and no one's throwing me a party, but you're going to throw them a party? I love right before this parable, Jesus says that even when one sinner repents, when one sinner turns, that the angels in heaven rejoice. Like, God is throwing a party in heaven when one person comes home, and yet here I am going, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve the party. You shouldn't have been in that situation in the first place. You made your bed, now you got to lie in it. How quickly we become the older brothers, but no one is undeserving or unworthy of God's grace. Let me say that a different way. All of us are undeserving and unworthy. And yet God sees us and loves us enough to give us his grace. And when we first receive it and it changes us, then we shouldn't be upset when other people receive it. We should be partying. We should be excited about what God is choosing to do in their life. So that's the older brother's perspective. Maybe you've been more like an older brother with some people in your life. And God's saying, no, remember what he did in you first and what he wants to do in them. And then there's a final perspective, and it's one of the father. And I've never heard this perspective preached before. Of course, the father represents God, and God's arms are always open. He's always welcoming us home. But when Jesus teaches a principle, he's teaching it from multiple angles and multiple truths. And, and I wonder if this perspective is for all of us in here especially all of us who are followers of Jesus, all of us who are mothers or fathers, or siblings, coworkers, friends, neighbors with somebody who's far off. 
I wonder if there's somebody in your life that right now they haven't come home. They're kind of doing their own thing. Maybe they haven't hit rock bottom yet like this younger son, but you're just watching it and you're going, man, if this person could just come back. From that perspective, the perspective of the father, the truth is for you and I to keep praying and be watchful. Keep praying and be watchful. I find it interesting that that this parable, as Jesus is teaching it, he says, when the son is a far ways off, when he's a long ways away, the father sees him. I find that interesting. Because Jesus could have left that out, but he didn't. He makes sure that that's in there. Why? Because when somebody's a long way off, you don't just see them. You have to be watching for them. When that son is a long ways off, it means that the father was watching. He's waiting. Maybe today. Maybe today's the day. He's praying, he's hoping that his son comes home. If you have somebody in your life who's far off, who's far away from God, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a friend or a coworker or a neighbor, be watchful, be in prayer. I love what the father does when he sees him. In that, in that moment, he has a choice. He can have an attitude of judgment, meaning he can say, finally, you finally came. I mean, it, you didn't have to make it be this long. You didn't have to go through all that pain, but finally you're here. Or he could have an attitude of gratitude. You're welcome. An attitude of gratitude where he says, thank you. God, thank you for bringing him back. God, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this story. Here's what's interesting about this story. We don't know how long the son stayed. The son could have left the next day. In a month, the son could have said, hey, dad, can I get more of my inheritance? Is there any more? Have you made any more money? Can Can I get a little bit more? I need to leave again. We have no clue. What we do know is that the father was watchful and he was praying. And when he saw his son, he responded. He didn't say, okay, are you done now? Are you good? Are you going to stay here forever? Whatever. He doesn't do that. He just celebrates his boy. To me, it's a lot like college football. I love college football. Uh, Those of you who know me, you know I'm a Georgia fan. I can say that with uh, my head held high now. Uh, I've got a buddy. He's an Alabama fan. He said, Ernest, you've uh, you've changed in the last two years. I said, no, you've just dropped in power, my man. (laughs) As a Georgia fan, the last first seven years of our church, I had to like say it sheepishly. Now I can say it with pride. I'm a Georgia fan. Many of you, if you're from here especially, you're a CU Buffs fan. Right? There's a few of you. I know you don't make a lot of noise, but it's all good. <laughs> now, what's the difference between the Buffs and the Bulldogs? Well, besides three championships, of course. <laughs> I think maybe the biggest difference is the fans. You see, as a Georgia fan, we have expectations way up here, meaning that like, we expect to win We expect to win championships. We expect not to lose. And so we don't look for the successes. We don't look for what to celebrate. We look for the failures. We highlight the failures instead of the successes. But Buffs fans, it's been a long go. And so when it's a long go, you look for the successes, right? Like like the spring game. As you know, in uh, 2021, uh, they had, uh, see, you had uh, 1,000 fans at the spring game. We had more than that at Easter, just to put that in perspective. No offense, Buff fans. Then in 2022, woo, there was like an explosion. 1,950 came to that game. But then this last year, 40, or just a month ago, 47,277 fans came. Why? Because there's excitement. There's like something new in the air. If Georgia would have had 47,000 at their spring game, the coach would have been fired. Why? Because we're looking for failures. We're not looking for success. But Buffs fans, they're looking for success and they're willing to celebrate that. Yes, that's it. We got a new coach. We got this and we got that. And every little thing is a success. I wonder what it would look like if we were that way with people. Like with people in our lives, I wonder if we looked for where they succeeded more than where they failed. I wonder with our kids, with our spouses, with our neighbors, with our friends, with our siblings. I wonder if we were the type of people that didn't highlight the failures, didn't say, well, I told you so. Well, we knew they were gonna do that. 
But what if we looked for the successes, even the really small ones, even just a son coming home? What if we highlighted those? What if we celebrated that movement? That's what it looks like to be watchful and to be in prayer. Is that any movement back to the Lord, you celebrate. Any movement back toward home, you celebrate. So where do you find yourself in this story? For some of us, maybe, maybe we're the prodigal. Again, maybe you're only here because it's Mother's Day and you knew your mom would want you here or your spouse would want you here. Last service, we had a a lady, she came because her mom. And then afterwards, she went up to her mom and she asked for prayer. Her mom said, what do you need prayer for? She said, I want to come home. Maybe that's you. What a great, what a great mother's gift. So if that's you, if you're the prodigal, come home today. What does that mean? It means we recognize that we're all sinners. In our sin, we can't, we can't do it alone. I'm like, when we do it on our own, like, man, there's, there's not much more that can happen. Like you're not gonna be the person that God created you to be. You need his grace and his mercy. So come home today. Maybe for some of us, we find ourselves in the older brother's perspective. Maybe you find yourself, you've been judgmental toward people. You've been like the Pharisees, the religious leaders and the teachers looking down on somebody in your life. If that's you, when we go to response time in a little bit, go to the cross. May just write down judgment. Just pin it to the cross. Man, I don't wanna wanna judge like that anymore, God. I don't wanna condemn people like that anymore, God. I don't wanna look down. I wanna celebrate the success of people. And then for all of us, I bet all of us, have people in our life, if we're real honest, we would say, and they're far from the Lord right now. And for you, I wanna encourage you to be watchful and prayerful. How do you do that? We're gonna give you one simple step. We put a, one of these cards on everybody's seat and there's, there's pens near you as well. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you, Right now in this moment, if you have somebody on your heart, maybe it's one person, maybe it's five people. For me, when I was praying about this this morning, there were five people in my heart to be watchful for, to be praying for. Some of them are family members, some of them are friends. And so what I want you to do in this moment is I just want you to write their names down. This is you committing to be watchful and to be praying over them. And then what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to come place it at the altar right here. Come place it on this stage. We're just going to have the band play a little bit behind me. And so as you write those names down, I want you to just come forward, and that's your commitment to say, God, I'm praying for these people. I'm going to be watchful, and I'm going to celebrate them. I'm going to celebrate even the smallest movement in their life. And as you lay those things down, I want you to know as a church, we're going to be praying for those individuals as well. We're going to be praying for them as well. And so that person that you might, might be writing their name down, they may be sitting next to you. Maybe they didn't come today. But my prayer is that as you write their name down, hearts will be changed, hearts will be softened, God will move, and they will come home. And so right now in this moment, I'm going to write my names down. I want you to write your names down. And then when you're ready, come forward, drop it on the altar, and let's ask God to move in their hearts.
Feel free to keep bringing names forward. I just want to pray over them. Father, we just pray right now for each one of these individuals, each one of these names. Father, you know, you know who they are, God. You know their story. God, you know where they are right now with you, God. You know, Father, exactly what they need, Father, to bring them home. So, Father, we pray for these daughters and these sons, these moms and these dads, these brothers and sisters, these friends and co-workers. God, we pray, Father, that you would move mountains on their behalf, God. That, Father, you would use us as we write their names down, as we're watchful and prayerful, God, that you would use us, God, to draw them back to yourself, to draw them to you. For some of them, God, they have tasted and seen of your goodness. Father, draw them back to that. For others, God, they have, they have never tasted and seen of your goodness. They've, they've never entered into a relationship with you, God. I pray that you would draw them. You would break down barriers right now in Jesus' name. God, we pray that you would move mountains, and I pray that this day, Mother's Day 2023, Father, that there would be something moving inside of them, even right now, right where they sit, right where they stand, God, that you would do something inside of their hearts and in their minds to draw them back to you, God. They may never know that someone put their name on a piece of paper, that someone else is praying for them, God, that their mama's praying for them, that their daddy's praying for them, that a, a, a son or a daughter's praying for them, but God, I pray that as we do, that you would move and you would shape their hearts, that you would draw them back to you, Father, and they would know that not only can they come home, but they should. Father, bring them home now in Jesus' name. Move mountains in Jesus' name. God, and may we be watchful and prayerful, and as we see movement in their life, God, may we celebrate it. May we give you thanks in Jesus' name.